Hello and welcome to our post webinar video where we'll be expanding on some of the templates that we talked about during our previous webinar on the solutions and workflows in interface development. Today we'll particularly focus on some more low level tips and tricks for three areas, building our template VMDs, building utility functions for template channels, and some best practices for connecting with databases or APIs. Now let's start with our first section of building our template VMDs. So here you can see my chameleon. Now, whenever you're starting out with building a template VMD, you want to start with importing your message definitions from the library. The reason for this is because it allows you to start with a uh, mostly filled version of your message definition based on the HL7 standard, in this case, version 2.7. From there, you can then customize it according to your particular EMR or uh, systems implementation guide. So as you can see, we have all of our segments already filled out with their appropriate uh, required or optionality settings and any uh, repeatability that's required as well. Now, according to the implementation guides, there may be segments that you do not need. And so we would recommend actually removing those from this VMD uh, message definition to ensure that you're reducing the overhead that is required. So for example, with our access restriction, we could remove the segment here. We could even remove full groups uh, with this option here. Besides that, you may want to consider looking at the optionality requirements, uh, as well as how often certain uh, segments may repeat, as that may be customized in the uh, EMR's implementation guide. So for example, they may have a segment that they consider required, even though by the standard, it may actually be optional. Besides these uh, the individual segments, you may also need to adjust uh, details from the fields. So that could be things like the requirements or even the data type. One common example is the OBX5, uh, field five, which if we pull up over here, you'll see in uh, the standard, by default, it is the string data type, but a lot of implementations will actually require a uh, CWE coded with exceptions or a coded with uh, no exceptions uh, format. And so those are areas that you would also want to consider looking into when you're customizing your standard message definition to your EMR's implementation guide. Besides your message definitions, you will also need to include a catch all condition. So this will help you catch any messages that don't comply with your uh, message types. So for the catch all case, you do need to go to the message definition map matching order. Make sure that catch all is the last one in this list and check mark this option at the bottom to ensure that it catches any messages that are not matching the ones above it. Besides this, when you're building your template VMD, you can also use the Chameleon message browser to help you check if any of the segments in any sample messages you may have uh, have been imported to the library yet. And that is a useful tip in case you uh, do have a custom message that differs from the standard message definition. So those are the main tips when it comes to building your template VMD. Uh, one thing to note is that the VMD does take more time uh, to develop, especially a template one. So we, uh, we do recommend uh, making sure you take your time with it, uh, build it out as thoroughly as well as you can, according to the implementation guide, because that will save you a lot of time down the road when you're rushed to build a particular interface with it. Now, moving on to our next section where we'll, where we'll be addressing uh, how to build your utility modules. The one thing you may want to, to keep in mind with working with template channels, particularly with uh, HL7 ones in our case, as we're looking at it, um, is that you want to implement the best practice of the separation of concerns. So if you remember from our webinar, we talked about your configurations, your mappings, your filters, utilities, all being separated out from the main.lua so that your main.lua can be as abstract and general as possible, allowing for uh, easier uh, customization to or reusing of that main.lua or even the full channel 
in multiple interfaces, even if there are multiple uh, message types present. In this the case, I've just built out a, some of the base structure. So obviously you would want any configurations like your VMD stored in a configuration file as well. Uh, however, for this example, we'll primarily focus on how you would build those utility modules that ensure that any modules, mapping modules, filtering modules you're using are all automatically and dynamically called based on the message type of your inbound message. So now let's take a look at our utilities module. With the utilities module, the main thing that you want to keep in mind is that it is taking a key value. So in our case, uh, the message type, and it's using that to identify which module to require. And it also needs to handle the results of that require statement, whether it's an error or it's properly handled. So in our case, we have a key variable. And so we will create a path that corresponds to our mappings folder and then appends that key name, which will be our message type. So that will be our ADT A08 for our first sample message. We then need to require the module. And to do this, we would recommend using a protected call because you may encounter any errors if the module is missing or um, if you've incorrectly called the module. So from that, we'll return success and our function from our call on our require statement with our path. So now we can check if it is successful, then we'll do one thing. And then if it's not, then we'll do something else. So if it's successful, we will return the function as it is, quite straightforward. And if it is not successful, then we want to check for two cases. One is the case where the function which would or the func which would contain an error string um, has the string not found, which means uh, the module is not found. So we'll check if this was uh, present or if it wasn't. If it is an error that is not the missing module error, then we do want to return an error with the description. Otherwise, we want to actually return a function that takes in the uh, inbound message as well as the message type. And this is based off of the function that we're actually calling normally, just so that we have uh, consistent syntax. And in this function, we want to return the original message. And this is useful because this can account for any uh, cases where you're working with an interface that has multiple message types. And only some of those message types actually require mappings, whereas others may just be fine with doing a pass-through interface. So this, was this would allow us to uh, use the same syntax and ensure that we catch those cases as well. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is that you do want to make sure that your mapping module is consistent and that it is returning a function and you are returning functions in these uh, three cases. And so now if we go back to our main, we can call our module function and we'll want to pass in our message type and the parameters for our in message and message type so that they can go towards our module. So if we look over here, we can see that we have successfully jumped to our build message function from our mappings module. Um, but if we go back to the main and switch to a different message type, we'll see that we have just received our ADT A04, uh, the in message version. Um, from our uh, use from our uh, else case here. And so this means that regardless of what message type comes in or which modules you have, this is all automatically handled and we can have a queue.push to then push that message to the queue. So the main takeaway here is that we do want to make sure that this uh, utility handles those cases uh, in a variable manner. So we do need to make sure that we are using the message type uh, in our path. If you wanted to create one, an equivalent of this utility for the filters, it's the exact same process. Main things to change are the actual folder or the path that you're uh, routing the uh, function call to. Uh, 
And you may also want to do something else instead of returning the original message. So for example, you might want to uh, create a default filters module and return the call, uh, return a call to that module instead of returning it to a specific, specific module. And so that's our utility module and how to use it. Now for our last section for today, uh, we do want to talk about how to connect with our database or API uh, connections and how what are some best practices when it comes to building those types of interfaces. Again, similar to our previous section, the idea of a separation of concerns is a very crucial uh, concept to understand and to implement because it really allows you to easily update and maintain your code um, especially if you're working with a template API module or template API uh, channel, um, or even a database one. This is especially the case for the API situation because each API, while, con while they do contain the same high level structure, um, their specific implementation may look a little bit different. So by abstracting out your code and ensuring that your concerns are all separated out, it becomes very easy to identify which pieces are unique and must be customized for that particular API and which pieces are common across all APIs. So here we'll look at three main sections. We'll look at our configurations and then the actions module and our connection object. So for configurations, we do recommend using the encrypted password module. As you can see demonstrated here, you can simply have a encrypt.save with your password value. So let's do password123 uh, and then a name for the file in which the encrypted password would be stored. So to make this as uh, variable or as adaptable to any new channel that you're making, I would recommend using our iguana.channel name function or perhaps the channel GUID. And then you also want to use a uh, set a, an encryption key to this encryption call. Once that is run once, you can simply comment it out and remove your password to ensure that it is not saved to our commit history. From there, the password can be easily loaded into any configurations that you are building. So in our configurations module, we'll want to group our credentials and perhaps any other details, such as whether we want the calls to be live uh, in the translator. Besides that, we also have some sample metadata that we'll be using for our annotations when we go through how to connect the, to an API. We also have a configuration module for our SQL queries, quite similar to what we uh, went through in the webinar itself. Again, these are the configurations where you would store uh, configurations that are common or likely to change across your different interfaces or iterations of this template channel or workflow. Now for the actual database and API interactions, there are several key areas that you want to abstract out. Uh, one is the uh, actions that are actually being executed. So whenever you're making a specific connection to the API or to the database, so that could be like a get, a post, uh, a, a database execution. Um, these are all functions that you want to abstract out and separate from any functions where you're um, building your header, building your headers, populating your body for your post, uh, or building your staging table. Um, this is because it allows us to identify the pieces that are common and uh, very generic, so our actions, from the pieces that are more specific to the API or the database, so uh, the headers, which are specific, um, the body parameters, uh, the uh, details that you're passing to the staging table. Those are things that are tend to be more custom, um, quite similar to how we have our mappings modules typically separated out. And so we want to have our actions module in this case uh, to handle those particular types of processes. Besides that, we also want to set up a connection object. Um, in the case of the database connection object, this is quite easy to do because the db2.connect function uh, handles that process of building your connection object. Um, and what you can simply do is call your configuration so you can easily populate that in one uh, single code call or function call. Uh, the thing to keep in mind is that you do want to ensure that this is called outside of the main, as we can see here, so that your connection object does stay 
in persistent memory rather than being reinitialized with every time the translator pulls. For the API connection object, it is a little bit more complex because each API is a bit more uh, involved in terms of the authorization and the process, especially if you do want to make this more of a template structure and, in, and uh, use the metadata to automatically generate functions to allow you to easily interact with the API. So here in our API connection object module, we first initialize our connection object. And then we have two main functions that we need to build. One is the actual connection process with the API. And then one is for initializing the API connection object as a whole. So starting from our initialization function, we'll initialize the collection by calling our connect function. Here we want to handle whatever authorization processes are required. So for the example of working with tokens, you might have a, a bunch of functions that are related to the connection. So getting things like storing the token in a uh, SQLite database, if you use our store to module, um, or perhaps getting the token via HTTP. In this case, I've just created a dummy token and also getting the token from our uh, DB2 cache. We also have an API call here, which we'll come back to later on. So jumping back to our connect uh, function, we also want to add this token to our API connection object since it is one that we will be, it is something we'll be using in uh, many of our API calls for down the line. Now that brings us back to our initialization function. Uh, where we next need to actually build and flesh out our connection object. So that means building our metadata generated functions, adding our help data, uh, and making sure that this API connection object is very easy to interact with uh, when we're simply uh, using this from the main.lua or from any mapping modules that we are creating. So in our build objects function, we need to first parse and retrieve our metadata. This is being retrieved from our configurations, as you recall. And then we need to actually build our metadata generated functions. Now, this section is uh, one that's very important because this is something that you'll need to understand. And especially when it comes to the operations we'll use in Lua, uh, these are really useful for helping you to understand how to dynamically build uh, your connection object um, in the API case. So we do have our parse. Uh, sample metadata, as we can see here. So I made a simple patient resource with a single get call and some uh, basic details. Uh, the structure of this would look a bit different across APIs, so you would need to adjust your code accordingly. But the high level workflow of what you're trying to do is quite similar to what we're doing here. So we want to loop through our individual resources. So I have a loop through the resource and our values. and from here, we actually want to create a, a table in our API object that corresponds to each resource. So we're going to dynamically do this by passing in the variable resource as a string based key value to our API uh, table and then pass in uh, an empty table just to initialize our new table. Now, when we iterate through our actions, we actually want to do the same thing. So we will access the resource table, and then actually create uh, a table specific to this particular action. So in our case, with this right now, that would be a get. So depending on how involved you want this to be, you could create a table here and populate it with the function as well as some other details. Or alternatively, you could simply create the API function call as a function here. So this would be the get patient function that you would call from say the main.lua or perhaps a mapping module. Now, since we're calling this from elsewhere, we want to make sure that we're passing in uh, any parameters that are coming in from uh, the workflow. So for example, if we're getting a patient, maybe that's a patient ID that we want to get. So we'll have parameters there. And now we actually need to make sure that we're mapping these parameters. We will probably have some headers that we need to build since this is an API call. So this is where we'll call our API call function from earlier up here. 
And we'll pass along the given parameters. So these parameters, uh, which I should actually name a different variable. So our given parameters, we'll also want to have our expected parameters based on the metadata. And we'll also want the type of action that we're working with. So now in our API call, we'll have, again, parameters, the given parameters, expected ones, and the type of action. Um, you want to match up your parameters with any expected parameters. Make sure you remove anything that's not expected by the API um, and possibly throw errors if there are any missing requirements. Um, and then build any other headers that you may require. In this case, we just map that directly uh, as p equals params, uh, just for the sake of simplifying this code. From there, we want to actually execute our action call. So if you remember our actions module where we had the specific get or execute calls, um, we've added that as a module um, that's accessible from our API connection module uh, as actions. And so now when we uh, want to access our actions, we can use the type that we've passed. So the, the word get in this case, and we're passing in our parameters as well. So what this means is that now we should be able to simply do patient dot, or API dot patient dot get, pass in our sample patient data for our parameters. And we should be able to jump all the way through our API call functions into this actions module where we would pass these parameters into our HTTP.get call. So if we go back here, um, we would also want to make some helper functions at this point, which we can simply do by calling our build help function and make sure we pass the expected parameters and the function itself. So we can apply uh, the details to that function. So there. So that builds our function, which builds our objects, which initializes our API connection object. Now in the main, uh, we do recommend for persistence case for uh, similar to how we would have the database connection uh, outside the main, you would want to have initialization outside, um, but you might want to have the connection object uh, in the main, just to ensure that the token is up to date before you handle any workflows. So to recap what we've talked about from this particular section, um, again, separation of concerns is a big uh, key aspect to how you can build your template in a way that is easier to update and maintain uh, and also easier to reuse as a template, or even if you just need to use particular portions, um, things like the actions module um, or, the, or the database connection modules. Those are pieces that are much easier for you to reuse once you've abstracted them out um, into their own separate modules or their own separate concerns. And so from today's three sections on our VMG templates um, and uh, building our utility modules for our HL7 template functions, and then also our uh, best practices and tips when it comes to working with database and API operations. We can see really the idea of separation of concerns and how that has been implemented in terms of uh, separating out your configurations, separating out your connection object, uh, separating out your utility functions, your mappings, or your uh, filtering. And we've also talked through some tips on how you can actually implement that at the code level in terms of things like how you can use a variable uh, to uh, a variable as a string key string based key value in a Lua table um, to allow you to dynamically build tables in your connection object um, and also use uh, functions as your values for those variable uh, keys. So I hope this video was helpful for you and that uh, just going through these three sections has been helpful in terms of understanding how to better actually implement what we've talked about from our webinar. Uh, we do have our next webinar coming up on November 3rd for Developing Interfaces 101. If you're particularly interested in the database aspect, uh, we will have more details in that particular webinar as well. So we hope to see you there, and we hope you continue to have a good 
uh, and enjoyable and efficient time working with Iguana and building your interfaces. Thank you again for joining us and hope to see you next time.